We are now in the twilight of the conference, and uh, we're at the bottom of the ninth in this conference. Base is loaded, and I'm going to be inviting uh, His Excellency Nathan Sales, Ambassador at Large and Coordinator for the Counterterrorism United States Department of State, Counterterrorism Bureau of the United States. I'll be introducing him. He's the cleanup batter of this conference. Ambassador Nathan Sales was sworn in on August 10th, 2017, as the coordinator for counterterrorism with the rank and status of ambassador at large. Ambassador Sales leads the State Department's Counterterrorism Bureau and serves as a principal advisor to the Secretary of State on international counterterrorism matters. Before joining the State Department, Ambassador Sales was a tenured law professor teaching and writing in the fields of counterterrorism law, national security law, constitutional law, and administrative law. His scholarship has been cited by the United States Supreme Court multiple times. Ambassador Sales previously was Deputy Assistant Secretary for Policy at the Department of Homeland Security and also served as at the Office of Legal Policy at the Department of Justice. He received the Attorney General's Award for Exceptional Service, the Justice Department's highest honor for his, royal, for his role in drafting the USA Patriot Act, as well as Attorney General's Distinguished Service Award. I can't think of anyone better to wind up this conference. The floor is yours. Well, thanks very much, Jonathan, for that uh, warm and gracious introduction. Um, and thanks to you and Boaz for uh, your hospitality today, and more importantly, for organizing one of the world's marquee counterterrorism events. Um, I'm especially grateful to you for using a baseball analogy to introduce me rather than a soccer one. Um, I know that we Americans can always count on our Israeli allies. Uh, this is actually my fourth time speaking at the IDC's annual World Summit, and uh, it's a real pleasure to be back in this room um, and, and back in this forum. Today's terrorist threats are complex and fluid. We face an ever-changing landscape of terrorist groups from ISIS to Iran-backed Hezbollah to an array of terrorists motivated by racial and ethnic and religious hatred. But today I want to focus on the group whose attack on the United States 18 years ago heralded the modern age of terrorism, and that, of course, is Al-Qaeda. The barbaric attacks of September 11, 2001 provoked a justified and effective response from the United States and our partners. We decimated the group's leadership in Afghanistan and Pakistan. We foiled their attacks. We denied them sanctuary. We, del we delivered justice to Osama bin Laden. But over time, Al-Qaeda has adapted to our counterterrorism pressure. What was once a centrally managed group that was based in South Asia has now evolved into a more loosely defined network of branches and affiliates around the world. We need to adapt, too. We all have a responsibility to make sure that Al-Qaeda doesn't rise from the ashes and regain its former strength. Today, I'll explain where we are in our fight against the group and why complacency is not an option. I'll start by describing how Al-Qaeda has evolved and the threat its global network poses today. Then I'll explain what we're doing to take the fight to the terrorists, including several new measures that we'll be announcing today. We must not mistake the recent dearth of Al-Qaeda attacks in the West for a lack of intent to strike us. The group's senior leadership core has been greatly diminished, but its regional networks are increasingly dangerous. Al-Qaeda branches and affiliates are actively plotting and conducting attacks across Africa. They're in the Middle East and South Asia. There's an Al-Qaeda presence in South America. These networks are a threat to America and our partners, and they remain focused on hitting us and hitting us as hard as they can. Let me give you some details. Africa remains a hot spot for Al-Qaeda. In West Africa, an AQ affiliate known as JNIM counts up to 2,000 fighters and its attacks span countries such as Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger. This threat is growing. JNIM continues to plot attacks against soft targets elsewhere in West Africa. In Libya, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb has taken advantage of political instability. It continues to maintain a presence and integrate its fighters into local communities there, particularly in the south of the country. 
AQIM has even conducted attacks as far away as Cote d'Ivoire. We're seeing a similar picture in East Africa. Al-Shabaab, the Somalia-based Al-Qaeda affiliate, continues to use safe havens throughout the country to obtain resources, recruit <laughs> fighters, and commit attacks both in Somalia and its neighbors. This January, Al-Shabaab launched an attack in Nairobi, Kenya that killed 21 people. Of course, the Middle East is where Al-Qaeda began, and it hasn't given up on its ambitions there. Al-Qaeda in Syria, which encompasses groups such as the Nusra Front, Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, and Haras al-Din, plots against the United States um, and others as well. From Idlib province, these groups are able to coordinate terrorist activities and plan attacks throughout the region and across the globe. AQS's ability to plot external operations from the cover of Idlib is a grave concern. For years, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula was perhaps the world's most dangerous AQ affiliate. The Yemen-based group claimed credit for the 2015 Charlie Hebdo attack in Paris, and it orchestrated the 2010 attempt to attack a cargo plane with bombs hidden in printer cartridges. It was responsible for the underwear bomber on a transatlantic flight to the US in 2009. None of this is ancient history. While AQAP has been significantly weakened by US counterterrorism pressure, its demonstrated proficiency with bomb making and security evasion mean we need to keep, continue to take it seriously. Now, we can't talk about terrorism without mentioning Iran, the world's worst state sponsor of terrorism. It is a documented fact that Iran continues to provide sanctuary to al-Qaeda operatives on its soil. The regime even allows al-Qaeda to move money and fighters between South Asia and Syria. This is simply unacceptable. On the face of it, a relationship between Iran and AQ might seem a bit odd. Why would a militant Shia regime provide refuge to a fanatical Sunni group that's bent on destroying Shias. The reason is that both sides find this marriage of convenience to be useful because their stated objectives converge. They both loathe the West and especially detest Israel. In 2016, the US Treasury Department identified and sanctioned three senior Al-Qaeda operatives residing in Iran. That added to the eight Iran-based AQ operatives previously designated by Treasury. 18 years after 9-11, Iran continues to defy the world and refuses to bring these terrorists to justice. Al-Qaeda also remains active in South Asia. In Afghanistan, Al-Qaeda Corps continues to maintain a presence, though greatly diminished by US counterterrorism pressure. As the US pursues a reconciliation process in Afghanistan, we remain committed to ensuring that that country can never again serve as a safe haven for terrorists and a base for their external operations. I'll repeat what Secretary Pompeo said in Kabul in July. We will always preserve our ability to keep America safe. Al-Qaeda has also established a presence in the Western Hemisphere. In August, the FBI added a Brazil-based Al-Qaeda facilitator to a list of wanted terrorists. The FBI seeks to question him about his suspected involvement in attack planning against the United States. And this week, the Treasury Department sanctioned him as a designated terrorist. Here's what we're doing to counter these threats around the world. The Trump administration is committed to ensuring that Al Qaeda can never again conduct another 9-11 style attack on our homeland. At the same time, we're working hard to degrade the group's ability to threaten our overseas interests or those of our partners and allies. Our goal is to destroy Al-Qaeda's global networks, just as we have decimated its core leadership in South Asia. Our strategy uses all instruments of national power, both military and civilian, and we're pursuing five key lines of effort. First, our military continues to use kinetic action to find and destroy Al-Qaeda, targeting both its leadership and its operational capabilities. Second, we're taking Al-Qaeda figures off the battlefield by prosecuting them for crimes they've committed. Third, we're aggressively using sanctions to deny Al-Qaeda the money that fuels its atrocities. Fourth, we're spearheading global efforts to harden borders against terrorist travel. And fifth, we're denying Al-Qaeda the ability to radicalize and recruit the next generation of fighters by targeting the group's toxic ideology. Let me say a few words about each. First, our military is taking the fight to our enemy. Less than two weeks ago, our forces struck an Al-Qaeda facility in Idlib, Syria, 
targeting those responsible for threats against U.S. citizens, our partners, and innocent civilians. This comes on the heels of another U.S. strike against AQS leadership near Aleppo in June. That operation targeted AQS operatives responsible for plotting attacks outside of Syria. Make no mistake, the United States will not hesitate to take this kind of action to deny al-Qaeda safe havens from which to plot and carry out attacks. In Somalia, U.S. forces operate in support of Somali and African Union partners as they take the fight to al-Shabaab. This year alone, we've conducted about 40 strikes against al-Shabaab targets to degrade the group's ability to commit attacks in Somalia and beyond. In Libya, our forces continue to target AQ elements. In coordination with the Libyan government of national accord, we've conducted a series of strikes, including a November 2018 precision airstrike near al Uwainat that killed 11 AQIM terrorists. We're also working to strengthen civilian responses to terrorism. Law enforcement is a critical counterterrorism tool, both prosecuting terrorists for their crimes uh, and disrupting terrorist attacks as they unfold in real time. For example, this July in Afghanistan, a police unit called CRU-222 that we've trained and equipped responded to a Taliban attack against an Afghan military facility. They successfully neutralized five attackers and evacuated 210 civilians, including a number of children. CRU-222 has responded to numerous attacks and carried out high-profile arrests. This unit's outstanding work is key to Afghanistan's efforts to establish and maintain a society that's free from terrorism. In Sub-Saharan Africa, we're assisting crisis response teams by building their capacity to disrupt terrorist attacks. In Mali and in Kenya, U.S. trained teams have responded ably to attacks on the Hotel Kangaba and 14 Riverside Drive. We're also seeing results in courtrooms. In Somalia, we've provided equipment, training, and mentoring for Somalia, Somali police force teams. These teams have responded to and investigated more than 400 terrorist incidents and referred more than 50 terrorism cases to prosecutors. That, in turn, has led to more than 100 convictions, including those responsible for the October 14, 2017 bombings in downtown Mogadishu that killed nearly 600 people. Next, money is al-Qaeda's lifeblood, funding its recruitment, travel, and operations. The aggressive use of sanctions is one of the most important weapons in our arsenal. Since 2017, the Trump administration has designated 26 al-Qaeda targets, including affiliates, leaders, operatives, facilitators, recruiters, and businesses. Earlier this week, the president announced the most significant update of our terrorism designation authorities since the aftermath of the 9-11 attacks. Under this historic new executive order, we're now able to more effectively sanction the leaders of terrorist groups, as well as those who participate in training to commit terrorism. We're already putting this tool to good use. Earlier this week, the State Department designated Haras al-Din and its leader, Farouk al-Suri. Haras al-Din is an AQ-affiliated group that emerged in Syria in early 2018 after several factions broke away from HTS. I'll come back to al-Suri in a moment. No matter how these groups choose to rebrand themselves, we will subject them to unrelenting financial pressure. Next, the United States is spearheading global efforts to harden our collective borders against terrorist travel. Al-Qaeda has consistently sought to exploit gaps in our border security, and we need to close those gaps. One of the best ways to do that is to share information about threats. That's why the United States is signing agreements with partners to share information about known and suspected terrorists to stop them from traveling. We now have more than 70 of these arrangements on the books. We're also helping frontline states secure their borders. For example, we're working with a Somali police force to pioneer the use of the MIDAS program, deployable cutting-edge biometrics devices that can collect and share information about terrorists and other threats. It's the first use of MIDAS in Africa. Across the border in Kenya, we're providing the border police with the training and tools they need to respond to terrorism and build relationships with the communities they're sworn to protect. This effort has greatly improved intelligence gathering, and it's also increased public support for these units' counterterrorism mission. Finally, we're denying al-Qaeda the ability to radicalize and recruit the next generation of fighters through a messaging strategy that counters its toxic ideology. Together with the UAE, the United States supports the Abu Dhabi-based Sawab Center, 
which provides an online counter to al-Qaeda propaganda. An effective Sawab campaign has highlighted the teachings of the Quran on mercy, tolerance, and coexistence. It serves as an important antidote to al-Qaeda's ideology of violence and hatred. I said a moment ago that the United States will continue to subject al-Qaeda networks to relentless financial pressure. That brings me to today's announcement. One of the State Department's key counterterrorism tools is our Rewards for Justice program. RFJ has paid out over $150 million over the years to more than 100 people who provided the U.S. government with credible information that has helped bring terrorists to justice. In 2018, we offered a $5 million award for Khalid al-Batafari, a senior member of AQAP. That same year, we doubled the RFJ bounty, up to $10 million, on senior al-Qaeda leader Saif al-Adil. Today, I'm announcing that the United States is offering a reward of up to $5 million each for information leading to the identification or location of three senior Haras al-Din leaders. Their names are Farouk al-Suri, Abu Abdel Karim al-Masri, and Sami al-Uraidi. Farouk al-Suri is the leader of Haras al-Din and a former Nusra Front military commander in Syria. Abu Abdel Karim al-Masri is an AQ veteran who served as a mediator between al-Qaeda in Syria and the Nusra Front. Sami al-Uraidi is a senior Sharia official for al-Qaeda in Syria. He previously was involved in terrorist plots against the United States and Israel. We urge anyone with information on these individuals to contact the Rewards for Justice program via our website, rewardsforjustice.net. All information submitted will be kept strictly confidential. Destroying al-Qaeda's global networks is a top priority for the United States and must be for our allies as well. None of us, not even the United States, can defeat this dangerous enemy alone. We will only succeed if we work together and work quickly to address this threat. Al-Qaeda is a global menace and it requires a global response. So today, as we commemorate the 18th anniversary of 9-11, the United States calls on our partners to prioritize the fight against Al-Qaeda and use every tool at their disposal to deny the group and its leaders sanctuary any place in the world. We're always grateful to see our partners step up, and I'd particularly like to commend our close ally, Poland. Early next year, under the auspices of the Warsaw process, the United States and Poland will convene a group of 70 nations to address and counter the evolving Al-Qaeda threat. This will be the first global conference outside the United Nations since 9-11 to focus specifically on Al-Qaeda. As the smoke cleared at ground zero, and we prepared to respond, we knew that the coming fight against terror would be a generational struggle. There are young men and young women joining the U.S. military today who were born the same year the Twin Towers fell. They know what this fight is about. If democratic values are to survive, we must prevail. And no one knows that better than our friends in Israel. You've been defending your nation against existential terrorist threats since the day it was founded. By staying committed to the fight, by joining together with nations that cherish basic human rights, I have no doubt that we will be victorious. Thank you all. Thank you, Ambassador Sales, um, for a very dynamic overview where at least there's a half a cup that's full with regards to the neutralizing of the actual terrorists the sanctions, and I hope those rewards are income tax free. <laughs> Even if they're not, <laughs> go get them. Uh, I think this um, brings to an end our conference. Um, some of you are going to be flying out in the very near future. Um, and some of you are going to probably maybe spend the weekend here, but uh, we want to wish you uh, very safe travels to whatever destination you're going to. Keep your eyes and ears open after these four days. And uh, for those of you who are first responders and uh, serving your countries, keep your heads down when you need to keep your heads down. 
stay safe, be careful out there as we say, and keep doing the great job you're doing. One of the most uh, dramatic parts of this uh, conference, we're watching the first responders and the military attaches of the United States of America standing at attention as we sang the anthems of both uh, the United States of America and the State of Israel. And uh, the bonding and the networking that has taken place um, in this conference are beyond imagination. I was speaking to Professor Bosganor about this uh, over lunch. And what happened inside the lectures and the workshops and outside the workshops and the lectures and the various individuals who exchanged cards. Some people told me that uh, if they're based in Washington, D.C., it might take them a few months to meet some key individuals, but here they could just have lunch with them or you know, schmooze with them um, over coffee. And I think this is why uh, this conference is the Davos of all counterterrorism um, as far as conferences are concerned. I would really love to thank uh, Boaz Ganor's uh, team, uh, Stevie and all these youngsters who have done such an amazing job. Where is Stevie? Stevie, come on up here. So Stevie, come on up here. No, no, Stevie, come on up here. Boz and I were very proud of Stevie because uh, we've watched him get his BA at IDC Herzliya, his MA at IDC Herzliya. We watched him come to Israel from Antwerp at a very young age and study at our university and be the right-hand person of uh, Boaz Ganor. And his patience and his uh, goal orientation and the way he functions, um, Stevie, your wife is lucky to have you. <laughs> and your beautiful kids, too. Um, and I'm not going to mention the names of all of the people on the team here, because it's impossible to do. But each and every one of uh, the team that's administrationally been working here and helping this uh, conference succeed as it is. Each member of the orchestra has played a really important role. And, and the interns, these young students running around here, and just uh, beautiful kids. Uh, many of them, by the way, graduates of uh, combat units, including American combat units, by the way. We have a number of uh, students here who are from uh, military academies in the United States and ROTC grads who are doing their master's degree here in counterterrorism, and some of them were helping us out. And uh, so, what can I tell you guys? I had a great time. Uh, how many people had a good time here? Anyone? Yeah. All right. So, we hope to see all of you next year at the 20th counterterrorism conference, just to show you that we're not getting any younger and that, unfortunately, terrorism isn't going away. At every conference, we find that there's something else we have to deal with. And don't forget to sign up for enough, OK? And uh, get thousands of other people to sign up for enough. And we'll try to do something on the social media here to uh, make the case. All the best. Shalom. And take care. <laughs>